my name is Char McCargo Ba, and I work for the federal government. I'm a policy writer with the federal government. And my other job is that I'm a professional genealogist. I was born and raised in Alexandria. I was born there in 1957, and I grew up in the Parker Gray um, district, and I attended Charles Houston, which is now a recreation center. And I also attended Parker Gray at, as, when it was a middle school, because it was once a high school. And then I went on to T.C. Williams High School and graduated in 1975. My parents migrated from uh, Halifax County, Virginia in the 1950s. They got married um, when they, once um, my mother arrived in Alexandria, they were married in Ellicott City. And all of their five children were born in, in Alexandria, Virginia. So I wanted to research Alexandria because I did not know when I was growing up the rich history that Alexandria had to offer to African Americans. And so I devoted basically probably the rest of my life in doing that and making sure that other people know all the contributions um, that African Americans made. Um, when I was growing up, we grew up in a neighborhood where we were not allowed to go outside the neighborhood. Um, my parents was from the South, and the people they socialized with came from Halifax County, Virginia. And so we were told just to stay in our neighborhood. So I did not know a lot of the movers and shakers at that time that were making history. At the time I was living there, I did not know that because we were in this closed environment. And so I just want to make sure that others know um, what contributions um, they made. Yes, I, I'm away from home about 13 hours a day on my day job, where I work in the federal government as a policy writer. And then when I get home, I eat, and I go into my genie role. And, um, and then I get every other Friday off from work. I do, that's my genie stuff. And on the weekends, that's my genie stuff. So I am two full-time jobs. So my husband has to put up, he has to mark my calendar when he needs to, to see me. <laughs> and that's how we work that out. What is special about Alexandria, I did not know about the black history of Alexandria until I was in my 30s. Um, when I grew up, I was um, coming in elementary school, it was um, segregated. And my African American teachers did not tell us about the black history in Alexandria. I learned that when I was 30 years old, taking a walking tour of Alexandria, and I was on the sidewalk screaming, oh my God, why didn't they tell me this? Why didn't they tell me this? And then I was told probably the teachers did not know themselves. So I find it special in finding out all of this good stuff in my, um, I won't say my twilight years, but my <laughs> middle of my twilight years, finding all of this information. The things that inspire me uh, uh, to do what I do is that because I was so shocked that I was living at a time that a lot of these people were making history and I did not know. Uh, also, I became very close to Mr. Ferdinand Day, and um, he's about 95 years old now, and he, uh, we wrote, I wrote about him in a, in a, a book that I published, uh, co-authored last year, and he was so concerned about his passing, and he stated, he said, Char, I really want to know, I really want people to know after I'm gone what all the contributions that the African Americans made, and I'm afraid that once I'm gone, it will be forgotten. And I promised him, I said, Mr. Day, as long as I'm kicking, and I hope I live as long as you, I will make sure that people would know the contributions that people made. Oh, my passion. I wish I had a job, a full-time job that paid me as much as my day job <laughs> for my passion. I'm a professional genealogist, and um, I started doing genealogy when Alex Haley came out with Roots. Now, Alex Haley never said he was a genealogist. He said he was a storyteller, and he basically was told stories when he was growing up, and he tried to find documentation for it. Unfortunately, he didn't find documentation for everything. But he made an impact on my life and many African Americans because I never in my wildest dream thought I could be able to um, research African Americans who had a heavy um, um, 
background in slavery. And so I just didn't think out of the box. He made me think out of the box. And so what happened is that um, I was in college at the time when his um, book came out. And I remember taking it to the bathroom and reading it because I was working part time. And my supervisor came into the bathroom and hollered my name and I jumped in the book went into the toilet. And I said, Oh my God. <laughs> and so what happened, I had to get another copy. But um, I ended up um, falling in love with genealogy. I started doing it because I thought maybe I'll find my African roots. Um, as 10 years pass or whatever, I was no really driven by just finding my African roots, but I was driven by finding the story. And I was able to help other people find more about themselves. And I guess that brought me more joy than anything to have somebody come to me and say, I have been adopted and I want to know about my family, but I don't know what I can find out about my family. For some reason, I have a niche in helping people locate family members. Um, the biggest project, I had several, but the biggest project I'm currently working on is the uh, Freeman Cemetery. This um, located at Washington and Church Street, and I owe it to um, Dr. Pam Cressy, who, who was the director of archaeology, now retired, and asking me to work on this project. And it has been, um, it has really been a um, pleasure for me to do so. It's a lot of work, though, <laughs> but I've been able to find descendants of a Civil War cemetery. And each time I locate a descendant and I tell them that they their family come from that, to see the joy on their face, to see like, oh my God, I did not know this. They lived and lived in Alexandria, grew up in Alexandria, and did not know they had people that came to Alexandria during the Civil War who actually buried some of their people at that cemetery. Some of them did not know they were they came from freed African Americans, and they thought their people were always slaves. And many of them um, were. Um, families who were here in Alexandria who actually were here in the 1700s. I mean, I told them, you're just as old as George Washington. <laughs> and so. Some of my inspiration, I stated, came from Alex Haley, but also my inspiration came from people who had no clue of who they were. Um, I had clients that ranged from coming from Germany um, during the um, during the World War II, a lot of African Americans as well as white Americans left children in Germany, and um, I was hired over the internet for a German uh, person to find his African American father, unknown to him and unknown to me. We were related. It was my great uncle who left him behind, and it was like wow, wow, you know, a type of uh, thing. And he came to us and spent 17 days here in the U.S. and stayed with us. And um, little, he's a spitting image of my great uncle. The only difference is light and, light and dark. But as far as he looks just like my uncle, same a mannerism, and never met his father. And so um, genealogy allowed me to bring in more people in my family. It allowed me to also help people who have medical problems. I research their medical history and find out what runs in their family. It allowed me to um, open up a whole window for them and relatives for them. So um, it gives me joy just to see how they accepted my research and I was able to give them something that no money could buy. Money cannot buy you your history. Money cannot buy you your relatives. Uh, if it did, I'll pick up some good ones, <laughs> but um, money does not allow you to buy those things. It's something someone has to give you and something that you are born into. And um, having them appreciate all of the research and appreciate what they have received has brought me a lot of joy. Genealogy is a challenge in itself. Um, sometimes you, don't, you do not have the records in place. Um, adoption, the adoptions for many are restricted records you cannot get into. Um, so it has a lot of challenges in genealogy, but those challenges make it so interesting and so intrigued. It's just like working out a mystery. And so um, you can overcome those challenges. And even if you have to take somebody out 
you know, for lunch and hopefully they leave the record for you to look at or whatever you have to do, you do what you have to do. And so, um, but it, it's all full of challenges because it's more and more restrictions that are, uh, are being placed on records that we can use because of privacy, because of security. So it gets a little bit more challenging. But if you've been doing it long enough, you find your way of finding those loopholes that you have to use to be able to do what you have to do. In genealogy, when I first started in genealogy, I lived at the courthouses. I mean, the smell, the dust, old dust, colonial dust. Look at books with colonial writing. And today, looking back, because I've been doing this for 33 years, looking, looking um, forward now, it's a lot of digital stuff. So what happened is that I'm still old school. I still actually would go on the internet and look and see, okay, I know the record is out there. I found it in this database, but I'm going to the courthouse to confirm because what, it, what it happens with digital, everything is fast, fast, fast. But what happened is that some things are cropped and they'll crop the document. And I might need to know who made a notation on the side of that document. So I need to go and look at the courthouse also for citation purposes and um, knowing that it has not been edited. It, and some things have been edited to be, make it look better on on um, on the computer, but what happened, I need to see it in its original form. By having it digital, I immediately know that, this, that it's out there, that I know now that if I need to look at the original, I can go to the courthouse, I can go to the archives or whatever I need to do. But I do not substitute what, my, um, what I have been trained to do for making sure that I use the computer and that's it. And a lot of people who are using, uh, doing genealogy now, what happens is that if they can't find it online, they figure it's not out there and, and, and they don't want to get out of their, you know, get out of their homes and go to the, you know, the libraries and they think that's too much work. But I enjoyed that because that's, when I first started, that's what I did. And I, I love that. So I can use both, but mm, I like smelling the old colonial dust. <laughs> I put on a lot of genealogical workshops. Um, this week I will be at the Holocaust Museum lecture and I do go to government agencies, libraries, museums, um, conferences. And um, I was giving genealogical workshops every quarter at the um, Black History Museum in Alexandria, Virginia. Due to the book being co-authored in the book that we did on Alexandria, um, uh, prominent African-Americans in the 20th century, it ate up a lot of our time and still working full time and retiring in October or sometime later in the, really re retiring later in the year, then I will be able to go back to putting on those uh, workshops. But the workshops are interesting. You have people come in and some people think they're not beginners. So they'll say, no, I'm advanced because I inherited this genealogy from my aunt, but nothing has been documented. They don't know what a census looked like, but they got this information from their aunt. And so what happened is that um, they want to go to the advanced classes. And then after we started talking, they realized, I think I better go to the beginner's class <laughs> because uh, you can inherit anything. But if you're going to write about it, you have to document it and you have to um, feel comfortable with the information that it is accurate. And it could be accurate but you might not be able to find a documentation for it because we know we have legal documents and then we know we have things that happened that never made it to a document. For instance, in my family, back to a period of time, we have bootleggers. Unless they got arrested, <laughs> you're not going to find a documentation for it. So you might have something like that. Doing uh, genealogical uh, research in a cemetery, it fascinates me. I probably got my spot picked out someplace there. But um, what happened is that cemeteries tell you a story. Um, some states, Virginia is fortunate that they, their vital statistics starts in 1853 to 1896. And then it stops for about 12 years because um, veterans from the Civil War wanted a pension. Virginia had not uh, had... Um, even um, set aside money for that. So what they did, they took it from the vital statistics. So you have a 12 year gap where no vital statistics in Virginia 
exists. And then they pick it up in, I think, in 1912. But during that 1853 to 1896, you find vital statistic records. But what if your ancestor um, did not, um, they didn't go to the court, uh, courthouse to record that it was snowing or something or some blizzard and they couldn't make it and then they forgot, you know, and so you're dead and nobody knows that you died. Cemeteries don't tell you no lies. When you go to a cemetery, you see headstones. If it's not headstones, if it's a church, his, church cemetery, then you can get the church record. But you walk through a cemetery and you can almost see family groupings. You see that a whole family is buried in a certain area. And you know that they connected. They might have different surnames. You can research things like that. You can see that a family uh, or see a group of uh, headstones together. You assume they're family, but you're not too sure they are because this. The uh, surnames are different. You can look for marriage license that they were married. You can look for um, ha having to be deaf records or other vital statistics, census records to see whether they're in the same household at the time they died. And you can get to know the people um, better by just walking through a cemetery and seeing how their, um, their graves are set up, whether they had money, they're usually going to have a headstone, no money, maybe not a headstone. And so you can tell a lot about a uh, person and the way they were buried and, um, and how they want to be connected, whether the husband and the wife are buried in the same grave, whether a small child is buried in the grave with their mother because the child died, uh, or they died together due to some kind of, of um, um, epidemic that was going on during that time. I work, I'm working on the Freedman Cemetery. They have no headstones. No headstones were there. The interesting thing about it is that the person who buried him there was Gladwin, and he wrote it in his in, in a journal of all the people he buried. And so we have the names of the people who were buried there, and I'm able to take those names and look at the early people in Alexandria and trace them all the way to the present. So I'm doing genealogy in a reverse reverse manner. You usually take yourself and work backwards. In this case, I'm taking the name of a person who's buried and working forward, and then I'm locating descendants. And so far, as of um, yesterday, I have found uh, 150 people who are buried there. I have found their descendants. Descendants. It's between 17 to 1800 that are buried there. So um, I got a, um, a message to God that I must stick around at least until I'm 90. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm never going to finish finding my deceased people. So um, the research and research in cemeteries, people get a little spooky and, you know, and don't like cemeteries. And usually when I go visit uh, Halifax County where my parents are born, my mom stays in the car. I know you're going to stop at the cemetery. I'm going to stay in the car. And so I have to visit the dead as well as the living because cemeteries don't tell any lies of any relatives have died and I did not know about it once who have migrated to New York, New Jersey, they usually want to be buried back at their um, uh, their hometown or at their church. And I always find someone who had died that I did not know. And then I go to the funeral director and I get the contact information who buried them. And I see, I found me another relative. <laughs>
and he was to it was two African Americans in a picture, a group of picture with white Americans, which you didn't see that much because Confederate soldiers did not want to be with African Americans after the Civil War. But I was able to locate who the African Americans were in the pictures. And so um, it's like a puzzle. You know, some people work puzzles. I work genealogy the same way people work puzzles. Yes, I um, set up a uh, website for Alexandra. Um, I had started writing when I was volunteering at the Alexandria Black History Museum. I've been a volunteer since the 80s there. I did two years in Sierra Leone, um, me and my husband and my daughter. My husband is from Sierra Leone, West Africa. We went there for two years, and um, when I came back, I continued my volunteer work at the museum. And I started a um, newsletter with them. And then, um, of course, technology moving forward, I took that newsletter, the research I was doing for the newsletter, and put it into a blog. And it's called The Other Side of Alexandra. It's about the African Americans of Alexandra. Since I've been working on a book, I haven't populated the way I wanted to, but I'll get back to that. But it's the unknown unknown information that people um, did not know about Alexandria. And it's, it's the success stories. We can always find the, um, the negatives in the newspapers. But um, like I said, I did not know um, uh, all the information that I know now, I did not know growing up in Alexandria. So it um, gives me um, a certain pride and also a being like an eyewitness to history that I did not know that existed. I'm thinking, you know, um, I think kids who are growing up, like especially if you are in high school growing up, how do you get pull them into doing history? I think on your mind is constantly getting a job, doing a career that you know is going to pay. So of course, technology is still at the uh, is at the top or going into medicine or some type of science because that will pay you the salary you need. Um, most people I'm finding out have dual careers, like myself. I, I worked as a policy writer. My undergrad is in uh, liberal arts. I have urban studies and African American studies, and I end up being a policy writer, so you figure. <laughs> but what happened is that I think we all have another side to us, and that's our passion. And getting children involved in history, we have to make it living and make history living. Um, history about yourself. Your mother's still living. Do you know anything about your mother? Do you know anything about your father? Where did your folks come from? Don't you know you got cousins out there? Where do they live? And so some people, they have lost their parents young and they never thought they could do anything. And genealogy opens up all those doors. It takes you places that you've never been. It tells you things that you've never known about. And it gives you a sense of purpose in life and a sense of who you are. And you can't get it in no other place unless you research and know yourself very, very well. So I think if they can look at history as I'm, I'm researching myself, I'm knowing about myself, I think then you can get people to be more interested in it. Well, I like to make a plug in for um, um, our, um, the book that I co-authored last year. And um, we have 63 African Americans that we featured in um, our book. And the um, book uh, is a just a taste of some of the genealogy because I did the genealogy on everyone that was in that book and um, common people who did not make it to national fame some of them I had difficulty because they were only known in Alexandria and when I looked for newspaper clippings and I read over a thousand newspaper clippings going from the 20th century I um, looking for them and some of them were only mentioned maybe a sentence or two. But still, I was able to flesh out a lot of their history by doing the census work, vital statistics. And those people were extraordinary because many of them were plain people who stood up and said, we need to do something to make our lives better and make the people's lives better. We need to open education up for everybody. We need to uh, um, make sure that African Americans are going to school with the main population. We have to make sure that uh, one of the figures in our book 
he 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 organized a bus tour from Alexandria with 200 people on the bus to go to march on Washington and his name was um, uh, Terrell he was an NWAC uh, person he also sold insurance he has his, he had his own life insurance company and when some African Americans couldn't get a uh, a loan from the bank because it was much more difficult then than it is today he loaned them money he gave them a, a loan and they would pay him back. One particular man is still living. He's 80 something years old. He said he went to the dentist. He needed um, some dental work. It was so expensive. The bank would not give him a loan. He had no collateral. But um, Mr. Terrell gave him a loan so he can go to the dentist. And so he remembered him for that. We have some people who, if they didn't do the one thing they did in life, nobody will remember them. They did not have any children. This particular man, um, his name was Fortune. And Mr. Fortune uh, was a janitor. He had children. He had a, a grandchild uh, that's still living. But he was a plain man. He went to church. He was a janitor at Parker Gray High School when it was segregated. It was a high school. And he did one thing that people remembered him for. When uh, Parker Gray started, it was an elementary school. By the 1930s, it um, added classes and it became a high school only to the 11th grade. You couldn't get your 12th grade from there. Well, Mr. Fortune was the janitor, and when the city of Alexandria decided to make it a high school, they put Parker Gray Negro High School. Well, Mr. Fortune did not want the students to be stigmatized by the word Negro, to look back at their school as a Negro school. So he put his job on the line, took a ladder, stood up on the ladder, and painted out the word Negro. And so it, it, in history, it would be Parker Gray High School. 80-year-old people who knew him, remembered him, and insisted that he should be in our book for that one act that he did. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to be recognized for something. It takes that small a thing of kindness to do for someone else and that you can be remembered for. And I think if people look at it, if they cannot do sports or be an entertainer or, you know, um, have a high, powerful job, make six figures, they would never be remembered. But a lot of those people were remembered by someone outside their family for that one little kindness they did for someone else. And if anything, I think that a person, if you live your life from the beginning to the end of your life, think about doing that one, one thing for someone else and, 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 and making their life better. I think in life, um, when you, um, I think when you are born in, born into this world, I think you should leave something positive behind. And I think that everyone should identify that very thing they strong at, that very thing that drives them, and find that positive thing within the thing they do best. And I think that um, this place would be a better place because we always think about people need fancy cars or whatever you know as soon as you step out on the road that car can go just like that and people look for fancy homes but what did you do for someone how did you brighten their day what did you give them to make their life better and we are all good at something you know genealogy is my niche somebody else might be something else but I think once you find that something else then you can be able to do something for someone besides yourself and that can make you feel just as good. How do I feel being part of the living legend is that it recognized the work that um, I have put into Alexandra and recognize um, the rich history and the colorful history that adds on to the colonial history that is here in Alexandria. Um, African Americans have been in Alexandria as long as I guess old George been here <laughs> and um, they have contributed in their own way and um, many people just did not know that and including myself until I started studying it and been able to see documentation of people being freed blacks in the 1700s people of course had slaves but they also had a large amount of freed blacks it makes me by recognizing my work it makes the public recognize the rich history that Alexandra has to offer. And hopefully um, they will continue doing what I do long after I no longer can do what I do. Being a living legend 
it recognizes people while they're living. I feel that it gives you your roses now and not when you're gone. And so many people tend to recognize people after they are gone and, um, you know, like giving them a party and they're not at the party. <laughs> so this way, being a living legend is like being at the party and being able to enjoy the people that um, appreciate the things that you have contributed to the society. I like to be remembered in that I was able to give someone something about themselves that nobody else could do. I found out in genealogy that I'm able to do some things that are unique from other genealogists. I have a strong passion. Once I'm given a case, I work on it. I work on it until I solve it. I don't ever think of it that it's not that I'm not able to do it. I just figure I got to find out a way to do it. And so um, I want to be remembered that I gave someone something that no matter no money possible could have been able to purchase it, and that I will leave them smiling. That they know more about themselves today than they did yesterday. <laughs>